Welcome to At Your Library. I'm Clayton Cheever, Assistant Director at the Thomas Crane Public Library. Please join me for a look at some of the free events our library is offering this September. I hope you are doing as well as possible during this extended coronavirus pandemic. We're still working hard to inspire curiosity, spark imagination, foster community, and connect people to the online world. This month, we are again rolling out some new services as we continue to do everything we can to meet your library needs. Last month, we started our to-go printing service at our main library at 40 Washington Street in Quincy Center. This month, we are excited to announce that we are now open for computer use, as well as printing, copying, scanning, and faxing. If you'd like to come into the library to do any of these things, you can make an appointment or simply drop by for up to an hour session at 10, 11, 30, 1, or 2.30 daily, Monday through Saturday. There are five appointment slots and one drop-in slot each session. If you need to print or make copies, you can have up to 20 pages for free. Scanning and faxing services are also free, and those are self-serve. We are also continuing to offer safe outside pickup of library materials and printouts at our main location in Quincy Center, and we have lots of free online resources too. Visit our website at thomascranelibrary.org to learn more. Have you always wanted to learn Cantonese or Mandarin? Perhaps you'd like to brush up on your high school era Spanish or practice English for a citizenship test. You can do all of this and more with our latest language learning platform, Transparent Language Online. Transparent has over 100 languages to explore and there's no library or card required. Just go to our adult education page, scroll down to the Transparent Language link and click through to sign up for a Transparent account. They even have a special language learning program for children ages six plus and it's called KidSpeak. The app for both iPhones and Androids is also part of the deal so you can take your learning on the go. Speaking of education, I don't know about you, but my appreciation for coffee started when I was in school, and I appreciated it for its ability to help me keep some pretty long hours. My love for coffee has only increased over the years since I graduated, so I am really excited to be able to host a program on Wednesday evening, September 16th, when we can learn a lot about this delicious elixir. I'm talking today with Eten Kalan, who is going to talk to us about the program happening on Wednesday. September 16th, starting at 7 o'clock in the evening on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. The program is a deep dive into coffee. E10, thanks for joining me and for uh, agreeing to share your relatively newfound knowledge uh, and love of coffee with everybody here in Quincy. How are you today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I mean, you and I have known each other for quite some time, and we've certainly enjoyed coffee together. Um, but... When did you first start drinking coffee? I don't think I actually know that story. Have you been a coffee drinker? I know you weren't. You didn't grow up a coffee drinker. I did not grow up a coffee drinker. In fact, I knew very little about coffee. Uh, growing up in a, you know, grow, I grew up in South Africa, but in a very traditional Indian household. So I grew up drinking tea from a very young age. Um, loved tea. Continue to love tea. Uh, I would say that coffee came new to me. Um, I was in boarding school. I don't think I drank much coffee in boarding school. Probably when I went to college is when I really started drinking coffee, maybe okay. too much coffee. Um, <laughs> but I think it was just to sort of keep me up and, and for my... Uh, it was a chemical stimulant. Yeah, yeah that's right. It's so to help me with my all-nighters, uh, which I don't recommend. Um, and that's when I first started drinking coffee and I would say appreciating coffee uh, and I think I went through all those phases that most people go through. Start drinking coffee. I went through my flavored coffee phase, which I'm not particularly proud of, but I, I've done it. Um, Did you go for the hazelnut craze, or what was your... Uh, what, what was your... the mint phase, believe it or not. coffee, wow. Yes, okay. yes. With the mint flavors. Yes, I, I'm with you. Um, and uh, ended up drinking, you know, then brewing at home, you know, for the longest time, used one of the big brand names and loved it. And um, is it a can of coffee that you can keep on the, the shelf forever? Exactly, exactly. Not realizing that as that ground coffee was sitting there, it was also getting stale. Right. Yeah. Uh, but but that's I started late in life, and but I'm playing catch up with coffee. So, are you a must-have coffee every day drinker? Do you kind of go in fits and starts? What's your 
as, as have you had? I know for myself, like, you know, I've, I've appreciated, there's been times when I drink a whole lot of coffee and then it gets really bad and I'm drinking too much and I get to a spot where I just have to feed the itch and I'm getting gas station coffee. And as soon as I've sunk to that level, I'm like, oh, I got to quit. So I've quit coffee more times. Like I'm really good at quitting coffee because I've done it many, many times, right? Um, you know, have you I, ever decided I, you needed to quit? Or? I've not quit coffee, but that's probably because I drink my two cups in the morning. Yeah. I do need my first cup. And then I follow up with the second cup and that's it for the day. Okay. Um, I have started drinking decaf at night, but we can talk more about that later on. Hmm, decaf. I, I know you and I have talked about that recently, and you said that there's some some good flavor decafs. I have yet to be convinced, so you're going to have to work, continue to work on me on that one. Well, once you start drinking freshly roasted coffee, then you start appreciating freshly roasted decaf coffee in a whole different way. So, so let's talk about roasting. And so you you've been drinking coffee for a while, and you had I know that you were you know you enjoyed going to a coffee store. Uh, that is based out of Seattle, uh, which we could, I'm sure at some point we'll, we'll, we'll drop their name, but we don't have to name them right now. They get plenty of publicity and all other sources. Um, but then you got interested in, in, in yourself dove deeper into coffee. What kind of spurred that, uh, that adventure? You know, so, so, so yes, I, I've tried and still like to try different coffee shops, different coffees, um, different roasts, and especially when I've gone out. Um, I would say during the pandemic, um, we were sitting around one day early March having dinner, the family, and we were talking about having more time on our hands, and uh, a conversation between my then 17-year-old son and I continued, you know, he started drinking coffee about four or five years ago um, and loves coffee. And we started talking about coffee and how much we love coffee in this house and my wife, Jenny, also loves coffee. She's Swedish. They drink lots of coffee in Sweden. And Ravi and I, were, my son, were talking about, wouldn't it be cool to roast our own coffee? And we looked at each other and said, well, what does that even entail? So we both went our separate ways and started researching. What does it mean to roast coffee? And I didn't know where to get green beans or how you roast, whether you roast it on a skillet on the in the oven, on your barbecue. I had no idea. And so we went and did independent research, came together and got really excited. Um, we agreed on a roaster we wanted to buy and bought some green beans online um, and just started roasting and realized that there was this magic with freshly roasted coffee that I've never tasted before. And it's changed how I approach coffee. And um, every morning now, I grind freshly roasted coffee, and that's what I drink. Mm. And I, I do know from having tasted that coffee that you are drinking some exceptionally fine coffee uh, doing it that way. Well, thank you. Yeah. And so we started roasting, and then we started sharing with friends like you and neighbors and just giving samples away, and people came back saying, you know, are you selling some of this? Are you drinking? And we hadn't really thought about that. And so we're like, well, maybe we'll package some and sell some to people. And... Um, and then all of a sudden, there was not, I wouldn't say the sort of spike in demand, but enough people that my son and I had to really think about whether we wanted to start a little small company, which we did, and ended up calling it Kalan Brews. Kalan's my last name, and Kalan Brews. Um, I know there's an awesome story behind Kalan Bros. So. There's a great story behind Kalan, why we came up with Kalan Brews. And I grew up um, in South Africa. My dad... Uh, was part of eight brothers. My grandfather and um, uh, my dad and my uncle started a, a store, a general store, which was called Kalan Brothers. And the, my dad, who's late, designed the original logo for Kalan Brothers in around 1959, and he hand-lettered it uh, with his own font. Um, and we've always sort of loved this Kalan Brothers sign, the store no longer exists. My uncle, who's uh, in his 90s, retired last year and closed the store down. Um, and then last year it closed. Yes, and he's wow. still alive um, and, 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 and very, very healthy. Um, and so we thought, oh, Kalan Brews is a great name because Brews is a play on both the brewing of coffee, but in many languages, you know, Swedish, Afrikaans, German, Dutch, 
Bruce also means brothers. So in some ways, we thought we would honor um, the sort of the, the, the family and the heritage of Kalan brothers and make it Kalan Bruce. And then my niece, um, who's a fashion designer, uh, a wonderful fashion, fashion designer in South Africa, um, said, why don't I use the original lettering of Kalan Brothers and make up Kalan Bruce for you? So my niece, who my dad's granddaughter, redesigned the Kalan Brothers and the logo Kalan Bruce is designed by her. So it's a nice little family sort of thing we have going on and everyone from the family has contributed in honoring my dad, my grandfather and his brothers. So would they have ever sold coffee in the Callum Bros uh, market or did they only sell tea there in South Africa? We sold tea and we sold, I think what would be then be labeled coffee would be instant coffee, uh, which probably mixed with chicory. Okay. And that's what, you know, I think back then um, constituted coffee, but that's as good as we went. Okay. And is there is, is coffee grown in South Africa? I know that there are other regions in Africa, but I don't know if there's any anybody who's actually actively growing any you know quantities of, of coffee that there are now. Do you know? There is a coffee farm that I know of, and I only know about it because uh, you know this, but uh, I'm an avid uh, safari junkie, and so is my family, and I'm also a game ranger in South Africa. Um, so very close to where we love to go in the Kruger National Park, there is the Sabi River coffee farm, which I've not visited, but now that we've entered this whole new world of coffee roasting, that's going to be a required field trip for sure. Yeah. Required field trip, and I'm going to bring back some green beans so that we can roast it. That's exciting. That's very cool. Yeah. Yeah. But so, it's, not, it's not a major coffee producer, but it is a tea producer. Yeah. Have you thought about, have you ever worked, have you thought about or, or kind of looked at brewing or drawing your own tea leaves and, and doing that. I, I don't think that's nearly as involved as, as the process for making coffee tea. You probably harvest dry and then steep, but and maybe I don't know enough about tea either. That's my understanding, but it's not something that intrigued me. And somehow this, the, the, the process of roasting coffee yeah. from different parts of the world and understanding flavor and taste profiles based on, where the coffee was grown, but also at what altitude and how you roasted it, just fascinated me, partly because there's a science to roasting coffee, but there's also an art to roasting coffee. And so the melding of those two intrigued me quite a bit. It continues to intrigue me. So have, I know that there are certain coffee shops that you know really pride themselves in the, the, the skills of their baristas. And it's not just about you know, how do they froth the milk and, and, and make fancy drinks, but it's also in their, in the tasting. And I wonder, I, I think this is something you'll talk about a bit, um, but how, if somebody's interested in developing their own appreciation, where would you start? So, you know, a barista plays an important role. How you make your coffee, so how you brew your coffee and your brewing technique is absolutely important. Um, and, and we all should be paying attention to that. And we're going to spend some time when we, when we gather for this longer program showing some different brewing techniques so people can kind of tell, well, share with, with our listeners and watchers today your thoughts about you know, how challenging it is to understand what different brewing techniques there are. I think that you had a really good point there when we were talking earlier. Someone wants to learn how to brew coffee differently than what they're doing currently um, it's challenging, right? You, you search the internet and there's YouTube video after YouTube video about, you know, the clever dripper, the stove tops, the machines, the automatics, the semi-automatics, the AeroPress. And there's no real way to find out what this coffee, what this process looks like, how it feels and the coffee produces without, take, without purchasing it. And not everyone can outlay that, that sort of money. Um, and well, so we want to talk about, and, and so we want to talk about different types of brewing techniques. But to go back to your earlier question, the barista is important. The coffee the barista works with is just as important. So you can, have, you can be a great chef, but if the ingredients you're working with are not great, there's, there's limitations to what you're going to produce. 
So the coffee you begin with and how it's roasted and how fresh it is and how it's ground is a key component of producing an excellent cup of coffee. And, and I want to talk about how you take green coffee, how you roast the coffee, how you think about grinding the coffee, how you brew the coffee so that you have a great cup in the morning. That sounds like a fabulous way to enrich the lives of a lot of people. I know that many, many of us enjoy drinking our coffee, but this is going to help take it to another level. Um, I know I've certainly done that with some of your beans already uh, and appreciated them. And, um, and I'm really excited to be able to share these tips with uh, the folks who join this program. So Eten, thank you so much for, you know, for d- taking this dive and for sharing your, the knowledge that you've been, you know, gaining uh, even like you've, you've gained this knowledge pretty quickly, I would say. Um, but it is, I mean, there's going to be a lot more than we'll even be able to share in the 70 minutes. So I, I love how you've broken it down into, all right, how do we, how do we pick the beans? How do we roast the beans? How do we grind them? And all the different options. There's, there's a lot of choices to be made here. So hopefully this will be giving people some, some tips about how can, they can navigate and feel more confident in those choices. Um, because and not just letting other people make the choices for them, which is what happens if we just go and buy a cup from somebody else. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to sharing what we've learned about coffee and about the whole process and sharing what we've learned so that, you know, your listeners and people who are tuning in can just be better informed as they make choices. Because I don't think there's a right or wrong way to do any of this. There's a informed way to do this. And of course, coffee, like everything else, depends on your palate and what you like and what you don't like. Well, thank you, Etan. I'm really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. So I hope you've enjoyed my conversation with Etan Kalan. He will be presenting a deep dive into coffee on Wednesday evening, September 16th, starting at 7 o'clock on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. I look forward to seeing you there. Massachusetts Climate Preparedness Week happens every September, and we are kicking it off here in Quincy with a program we're calling How to Save the World from Climate Change. We're presenting this in collaboration with QCAN, the Quincy Climate Action Network, on Tuesday evening, September 15th at 7. I recently got an opportunity to talk with our presenter and a friend from QCAN about this program. I am talking today with Ron Jedkoff and David Reich, uh, David joins us from the Quincy Climate Action Network, and Ron joins us as a pioneer in the field of efficient design. He's recently retired as a chief architectural engineer at the National Renewable Energy Laboratories uh, in Golden, Colorado. We are talking about a program that Ron will be presenting on a Tuesday, September 15th at 7 o'clock. The title of that program is How to Save the World from Climate Change. Ron, why don't you tell us yourself how... How are you affiliated? Uh, what, what kind of credentials are we putting behind your name today? So um, I recent re- recently retired from the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and uh, NREL, uh, commonly called. Uh, many years ago, it started out being SERI, Solar Energy Research Institute, which the uh, older generation among you might have heard of. Um, and uh, I have been with them since uh, 1978. Um, which I understand is after you and David first met. Um, David uh, was very excited and, and, and pleased to reconnect. Um, David, why don't you tell a little bit about, uh, we don't have to put a date on that, but uh, I, I, I thought it was, it, there was a great story there. I'd love you to share <laughs> how, you, uh, how you and Ron made this connection originally. Well, Ron uh, lives down the hall from me in uh, college. He uh, arrived uh, one year from... Uh, fresh from a year at the Sorbonne, and we were both uh, French students, mm-hmm. and uh, he ended up uh, changing his focus uh, ultimately, and I guess I did too, and uh, but we've known each other uh, for, uh, put it this way, well more than half our lives, and uh, uh, I uh, have seen Ron several times since then, uh, uh, once when he was about to uh, leave uh, for the Peace Corps in Africa, which was, I, I gather, a life-changing experience for him. And uh, then uh, 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 later on when he had, uh, I think, uh, recently uh, uh, started working uh, 
and Anne Rell were its uh, predecessor out in Colorado. Were you doing activism uh, at the time? Did you know each other through, or is it just, you guys were just living on the same hall? Uh, no, we were uh, we were uh, in a uh, French language only dorm, so it was a, it was actually a little house, uh, and uh, everybody knew each other quite well. And I think in those days, everybody was pretty much doing activism. Uh, you know, if you were breathing air, uh, you know that that was in the air. Okay. And so your initial conversations, I assume, there were all in French. That's that's cool. Just to <laughs> theoretically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Ron, do you remember it the same way? You so Dave was just yeah, saying, yeah. So we we lived in a in a house at Tufts University, um, and uh, it was called the French House. And one of the benefits was that of, was wine and cheese. Uh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. You were smart men then. That's great. <laughs> and so your path took you from the Peace Corps, and were you doing engineering work for the Peace Corps and helping people do? I I, I was. That's what that's what really um, you know got me set on the path that I ended up on. So I I was doing rural infrastructure construction works. Uh, they weren't necessarily energy works, but. Uh, we were digging water wells. I sunk about 42 water wells while I was working in West Africa. Um, we also built a few uh, baby birthing clinics out of reinforced concrete so that they could actually be sanitized. Because mud, mud brick is very difficult to sanitize. It, I can imagine. Yeah, it tends to melt away when you try to <laughs> when, you, when you try to high sanitize. pressure wash is not a good idea on those. Not a good thing for that. Um, yeah, so and sanitary facilities um, also were part was part of the project. So I was doing basic uh, construction, and that sort of oriented me toward uh, architectural engineering, um, which I then emphasized in grad school after returning from the Peace Corps. And so then and, you went to grad school, and then you worked for the Energy Labs, uh, which you recently retired from. That's yeah, so getting a large amount of time. I know. Yeah. One of one of the things I noticed when I was working over there was that the indigenous architecture, um, in the absence of electricity, which um, even if you were in the capital city of those countries, the electricity would go down all the time. And so European style buildings, like a, if you were staying in a hotel, European style building, as soon as the electricity went out, they became uninhabitable, whereas the indigenous architecture remained maybe not quite up to our standards of comfort, but they, they remained um, habitable um, with no power input whatsoever. And so I got curious as to why that was and what was the features and uh, nature of the materials that were being used and you know why, why did indigenous architecture work? And that, that got me pointed in the direction of architectural engineering. So, Help me understand, the program that we're doing is all about how people, how all of us, what kind of individual steps we can do to fight climate change. And I think the lens that I assume you're, you're gonna bring to it is the individual choices we make as consumers, as as people that are shaping our own like immediate environment. But is it more actually, than that? Actually, that's, that's not quite what I'm gonna be talking about. Right, I'm correct. gonna be talking about that. <laughs> The uh, techn technological developments that have occurred at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory that um, allow us to transform our energy system to a non-fossil based uh, energy system with, without um, at scale. So, you know, rather than, I mean, it's great if people, you know, want to put photovoltaic panels on their roofs and that there are places where that's very cost effective and e economical now it's a good deal um and so i totally encourage people to do that on an individual basis but it's even more cost effective to go the uh solar garden route where you get the economies of scale um and uh you also get the advantages that you don't have long um utility runs so if you have local for let's say for an entire town 
you have a uh, solar installation for that town that's nearby. It doesn't have to have a long utility run, but it still uh, benefits from the cost effectiveness of, of scale. And we can start stepping away from some of those really dangerous pipelines that are using, you know, trying to take oil across these massive distances. And exactly. Yeah. So, um, and also at utility scale. Um, so if, you know, when uh, renewable and we're so close to being there, we are there in some places where renewable is the least cost, um, the least cost for the utilities. And I'll show some examples of that uh, that we've had out here in Colorado, just in the bid process for how Excel Energy, one of the largest uh, utilities in the country, how Excel Energy, um, you know, uh, every, every couple of years they put out for bid uh, so that they make sure they have energy available to them. And uh, the lowest bids came in from renewables this time. Well, that's really encouraging. Yeah. 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 So it's just economics and many of the large investment firms are now moving away from fossil fuel based investments and are um, actually pledging really large um, renewable and sustainable energy investments. And they're not doing that because they're nice guys. Um, <laughs> there, I, I mean, they may, there may be well, some, well, maybe, but that's not what motivates, but them. that's not why they're doing it. They're, they're doing it because, um, they're realizing that the, that the most cost effective bet for the future is uh, sustainable energy, non-fossil energy system. Yeah. And it's, it's coming full circle. I'm sure that, you know, the reason they were living in, you know, in, in the housing, I mean, there had to be a pull in Africa when you were in West Africa for indigenous housing, not just because it was the local piece, but because it was actually more comfortable when they didn't have the power. I mean, there was, they weren't just trying to like, you know, be true to the roots, although I'm sure that that was an important <laughs> element. It was more comfortable, um, which is kind oh, of- Well, actually, there, there's some interesting, down. there's some interesting examples. There's a, an author called Hassan Fathi, who's written about, um, uh, arch indigenous architecture in the Middle East. And uh, he, there was an example where the government actually came in and created a whole new town for people that were living in uh, indigenous architecture. They actually lived in underground. Wow. Their indigenous architecture w was underground based building. And uh, at first they were all excited about it. You know, they're saying, oh, we're going to be really modern and live in these. Uh, they went in into them and they were so uncomfortable that they all moved back to their <laughs> <laughs> original indigenous yeah. um, houses. Well, this sounds really fascinating and it sounds like it's gonna be give, helping us give tools so that we can push for public policy that's going to be more efficient with our resources. It's gonna be more comfortable. Um, we haven't talked about jobs, but I, you know, everything that I've, that I've seen recently, there's a lot of labor that's going to be needed to do some of this. Um, so well, the interesting thing is you can't outsource, um, you know, building these distributed um, solar, wind, um, also energy efficiency in our building stock. Those are all things that are highly distributed. You can't outsource them. They take a lot of um, uh, labor. Um, and it's not just, um, you know, the, um, it's not just mindless labor, it's labor that has to know what they're doing. So it's, it's, it's a good, you know, it's a set of good jobs that have to do with um, doing all this stuff. Well, that, that is super encouraging in all sorts of ways. I really look forward to the full presentation. So thank you for agreeing to join us. David, is there anything that you'd like to add here at the, at the end? Well, I, I, I just want to add that uh, Ron uh, is a, a natural for our organization. Uh, we're all about uh, climate solutions and uh, that includes uh, more than anything else, uh, uh, efficiency and uh, renewable energy. And that's what Ron has uh, done his whole career. And it's what he's going to be talking about. So, uh, I'm uh, uh, really thrilled to uh, be able to co-host uh, the event, and I'm looking forward to it. Great. Well, thank you, David. I'm really looking forward to uh, co-hosting the event with you. I'm really grateful that you helped make this connection with Ron. And Ron, thank you so much for making time to, to share your, your 
deep, I, you know, wealth of knowledge with this. I'm really looking forward to hearing more. Sounds really yeah, fast. well, it's my, it's my pleasure to do it. And it's also, I think, in a, in, in a sense, also a responsibility to do it. Uh, you know, uh, I had the good fortune to be able to uh, do that kind of research for a long time. And I certainly want to share uh, the results of that research with people who need it and want to act upon it. Well, I'm glad to be part of that process. Thank you, Ron, for giving us the opportunity. It's great. So I've just been talking with Ron Judkoff and David Reich. Ron, from a recently retired member of the National Renewable Energies Laboratory, and David with Lindsay Climate Action Network. We were talking about the program Ron will be presenting on Tuesday, September 15th, starting at 7 o'clock on Zoom, YouTube, and Facebook. And the topic of that program is how to save the world from climate change. I hope you enjoyed our conversation, and I hope you'll join us on the 15th. As I mentioned before that conversation, we are participating in a statewide effort called Climate Preparing This Week. I encourage you to register for one or all of the programs that are being presented this year. On Thursday the 24th at 1 in the afternoon, a panel discussion will be led by Enna Okurazita and hosted by the Yale School of Forestry's Library, and it will include women farmers in Zimbabwe and their experiences dealing with climate impacts in a program called Resilient Agriculture, Climate Impacts on Our Food Systems and How We Can Respond. Later that same day, there's a virtual discussion with acclaimed writer Eric Kleinenberg, librarians and community members. Kleinenberg is well known for his novel, Heatwave, a social autopsy of disaster in Chicago, and his more recent book, Palaces for the People. This is starting at seven. On Friday morning, September 25th, you're invited to an overview of a Boston mapping project with the Conservation Law Foundation and the City of Boston. This program will explore the community assets that exist within the City of Boston and how they can be leveraged to create a more climate resilient future with a particular focus on how we can serve communities of color and other marginalized neighborhoods. The name of this program, which starts at 10 a.m., is Neighborhood by Neighborhood, Mapping Our Resilience to Climate Change. On Saturday evening, September 26th at 7, Dr. Madhavi Venkatasan will present a program on the economics of climate change. Wrapping up Climate Prep Week on Wednesday, September 30th, I invite you to join a conversation with Communities Responding to Extreme Weather Program Director Reverend Vernon K. Walker and Reverends Carleen Griffiths-Siku and Hajar Logan about how there is no climate justice without racial justice and how the fight for equality has to be led by those who have been most impacted. This program will start at 6.30. All of these Climate Prep Week programs require registration, so please go out to our calendar where you can find individual event details and registration links. On Tuesday morning, September 22nd, we are kicking off a four-part series of programs all about aging with strength. I recently got an opportunity to talk with nurse Debbie Lynn Tooney about this series. I'm talking today with Debbie Toomey, uh, who is the coordinator of the Tufts Medical Center Injury Prevention Program, is going to be doing a program for us here at the library, live on Zoom, on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, the program is Aging Strong, and it's happening on September 22nd, 29th, October 6th, and October 13th. That's four consecutive Tuesday mornings at 10 o'clock. Debbie, thank you so much for, for joining me out here and talking to me today. I'm really glad that we can do this program together. Clayton, I'm so happy to be here and to be able to share uh, to the members, the public, about the Aging Strong program that I created for Tufts Medical Center. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, a, it's an evidence-informed program, and uh, I'm working on uh, another organization to make it evidence-based. And basically, that means, what, what does, does that, that mean? mean? Yeah, what does that mean, evidence-based? That sounds so fancy. Uh, it just means that um, evidence-based means it's research proven. So I, in creating this program, which is basically it's a false prevention program and also a program that uh, motivates the aging population to uh, continue to move, to continue to learn, to be a lifelong learner and how that can make the, a 
big difference in the way we live our life, the way we communicate with others, the way we take care of ourselves. So say, evidence- the aging population really does talk about, I think you mean people that are kind of at the advanced stages of aging. Hopefully we're all aging. Otherwise, what are we doing? Um, yeah. But this does, yeah. you sound like tips that would be great for everybody to learn. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, this is great for the, the caregivers, the uh, people who consider themselves in the sandwich generation, like myself. I'm a, I'm a nurse, injury prevention coordinator, but also I'm a mom, I'm a wife, uh, I have three boys, and also I have um, parents who um, you know, are really young at heart and active. So I'm in that sandwich um, generation, but still um, can benefit from the, the information that I will be sharing. So people 50 and up, I would say, would benefit. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, again, just going back to the evidence base, so a lot of the information that I'll be sharing that I created, that I added to the program, are from the research. So that way you know that it's legitimate information. So you're not just making this stuff up. This is actually mm -hmm. based on looking at a lot of different people and what has actually been proven to work. Yes, yes. So a lot of information from the CDC um, and also the Na National Council of Aging. So Debbie, I'm curious, Obviously, the program is going to focus on what you just said and helping people learn how to age strong. Um, something that I'm, I wouldn't expect that you're going to cover a lot, but maybe really interesting to know um, is a little bit more about you and how you got to be interested in, and even how you became a nurse and became the coordinator of injury prevention uh, at Tufts Medical Center. Help us get to know you a little bit. How long oh. have you been a nurse for? Oh my gosh, I, I've been a nurse, I, uh, well, I'm going on over 30 years now. Get out. Yes, I'm out, I'm out. <laughs> yeah, so I graduated, I you went to- when um, you were like three, I guess. Oh gosh. Well, you know what, I was born in the Philippines, but basically grew up in Quincy. Okay. Uh, I've been here since I was nine years old and went through the Quincy Public School System. Right. Loved going to the Thomas Crane Public Library and Quincy Square and all that. So, and currently still live in Quincy. So um, my heart belongs here in Quincy. Um, and I love to be able to share any type of um, programs that can, you know, it's in alignment with health and wellness. I became a nurse because uh, I didn't know back then when I was little, but my, one of my core main values is helping people feel better. Mm -hmm. And for me, that translated into being a nurse. And graduated from North Quincy High School, got a, you know, went to UMass Boston for nursing. As right before um, graduation, I got a job at Tufts Medical Center. So I've been there. I pretty much grew up there at Tufts Medical Center. Wow, that's quite a story. <laughs> that's really yeah. rich. So did, you were like frontline working on in, in one of the, the departments, I assume, for a bit before you became the injury prevention coordinator? Or? Pretty much, pretty much. I spent a lot of my careers working in the adult side, medical surgery, uh, and then um, learned and also took care of uh, and got trained in taking care of cancer patients, um, orthopedic patients, patient, cardiac patients, and then I transferred to the anesthesia department, and now I'm in the trauma department. So Tufts I Medical Tufts Center. Tufts is, is a trauma one center, and you see yes. some really serious trauma at Tufts. Yes, that's right. So it's a level one trauma center, and basically just like Boston Medical Center, Brigham Women, Beth Israel, Mass General, we're all the key Boston hospitals are level one trauma centers. And so then there's level two, like level three. Car crashes, um, yeah. if there's a complicated, you know, any, any kind yes. of complicated injury, you know, yes. whether it's a fall, whether it's it's a violent attack, you know, I don't, I don't yeah. know the majority of the yeah. accidents. In, in Gunshot wounds, yeah, uh, fatal car accidents, um, a lot of the, the really complex um, admissions or, you know, accidents. Uh, that um, that the suburbs, uh, the suburban hospitals are not able to take care of. They transfer them to um, the bigger hospitals like Tufts Medical Center. And I'm sure in doing that work, you had to witness situations where people had had that significant trauma that could potentially have been prevented if they had taken more attention to how to increase their strength or maintain their strength as they were yeah. aging. Um, yes. So I assume that was kind of the bridge from that work and saying, wait, how do we go about not just, you know, putting on Band-Aids and very, very complicated Band-Aids um, to actually preventing the injury in the first place? Exactly. So it was a lot of the key, one of the key takeaways that I learned being a nurse 
um, and taking care of hundreds, thousands of patients is how important prevention is. How important it is, just like, you know, starting, you know, the forest fire, you know, Smokey the Bear, you know, it's just so... Only you, that's right. <laughs> that's right, in the hat, right? <laughs> um, but prevention is just such an important element, and there's really not too much funding in that, um, you know, national, nationwide. So it's so important to really put that in the, in the, um, the forefront of your, you know, thinking how important it is to think about what you're doing and also know the resources that you, that's available because there's so many free resources, really amazing free resources out there um, to educate everybody on how to make healthier and safer choices, right? And that's why I'm really glad that we at the library can help with that. We love providing everything we do is for free and we love, I mean, our specialty is connecting people to resources. So thank you so much for bringing this, Debbie. Sure. Let's talk a little bit about, so there's going to be four sessions. Um, they're starting um, on the first session is going to be learning about exercises. Um, the second's learning about, I think, skills. Then we're doing communication and then putting all together in the fourth. My understanding is that, and obviously as I, as I spell it out that way, there's going to be benefit from attending all four. And so hopefully most people will be able to do that. We will be recording them so that if people miss one or, you know, they, you know, let's say they're, they're only even watching this video with us right now, after the first one has already passed, they can come in and, and watch the recording. But if people are super busy, do you think they could just drop into the third um, and say they really wanted to work on their communication skills, but they feel like they're doing a great job with exercising and, um, mm -hmm. and, and you know, they've got, they're, they're super coordinated, but geez, nobody will ever understands what they have to say, or they, they're not very good at communicating their needs or, you know, they've just been frustrated. Would you recommend, I mean, not that you'd recommend, we'd recommend that people attend all four. Is it going to be possible to just drop in and, and, and participate as people are able? Yes. So, yes, it so the answer is yes, 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 yes. Awesome. Uh, I do. Uh, <laughs> I do encourage people to participate. Um, you know, um, in all four sessions because um, I created it so that each week builds on the other. So, uh, like you said, week one or session one is um, strong body. So. People, everybody knows that it's important to move, to exercise, right? It's important. Um, so I just kind of break down different types of exercises. We do a warm up, and also we go over some of the exercises provided um, by the physical therapy department uh, from Tufts Medical Center. Um, and you so, have some tips to keep that from being boring. I find exactly this is boring exercise, but sometimes it's just like, Really? Another walk around the block? Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, you know, I, I try to make it so, and I, you know what I did? I'll be honest with you. I, I, I go to the Y, I walk. But when I think, I used to think about exercise, there's just like, I have an image in mind of what exercise is, or you see the, the magazines and you see people exercising. But what's really not explained is there's different types of exercises that's important to kind of focus on as we get older. Mm -hmm. um, so that way we're, we're balanced in our body, we're more coordinated and we have more endurance. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I'll cover. Uh, and then session two is strong brain and strong mind because as we get older, the brain changes, the mind changes. And so the cool thing is there's exercises for both. And that's actually a popular one popular one because I introduced mindfulness to that. And that's one of my passions is mindfulness. And a lot of the people who have shared mindfulness exercises with are just, they love it. They love it because when they think of mindfulness, they think of, oh, okay, I gotta go away. I gotta go and I have to meditate and I have to empty my brain. Uh, no, that doesn't, <laughs> it's impossible to empty the brain. So, you know, we go you over need to really sit with your brain. That's right. You yeah. Sit with your brain and notice what's going on in the brain. Yeah. That's mindfulness right there. Um, so again, so that's session two. And then session three is helping the person become more of a stronger advocate for themselves when they're in front of the white, you know, the white coats, the white coat yeah. syndrome, right? The like the doctors. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. The pharmacists. All, sometimes we get, you know, we, we have ideas. Um, things that we want to go over with them. But when we go there, when we, get, when we finally get there, we get so, you know, we get so intimidated sometimes. And all we do is just say, yep, 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 yep. So giving them information, giving people information, basic information that can help them um, jog their memory when they're there or just kind of go over some basic questions. So that way the doctor knows 
that the person who is in front of them has, um, has given them as much information as they can. Because you know what? Nurses and doctors, we don't read minds. We don't read minds. What? what? We want to hear from you. <laughs> we want to know how you're doing. Don't be shy. Please let us know so we can help you best. Um, and then session four is a strong plan. So based on what we experience, what you experienced the last you know, three weeks, which ones do you think you might want to start using for the next 30 days maybe or for the next week so that way you'll be able to have a stronger stronger idea of what to do after the program it's not a program that i hope people say oh that that was nice and then they forget about it Great. so <laughs> well that, that sounds like it's it's going to be a wonderful experience i hope lots of folks are able to tune in and we will be recording them and sharing them yeah. um, in the future so that people who who aren't able to do it live can can hopefully benefit as well so yeah. i'm really excited to be doing this together thank you so yeah. much yeah i'm very excited too and the only the only thing i would ask for people to do is just make sure they have a chair um yeah. when they're doing the program so that way you know you participate as much as you can, but, you know, know your body, have the chair available. So that way, if you want to participate and just, you know, do the movements, sitting down, do that. So doing this on a phone, on a stand up paddle board is not recommended. That's no, That's not okay. at all. Okay. No, not Find this time. <laughs> <laughs> Find a safe, comfortable place. Yeah. Uh, and just uh, make sure that, um, you know, you, you listen and and as you explain it's recorded so don't feel like you have to take so much notes um just take in what you can because what how i explain things and what i go over i can assure you you already know you already know it's just me trying to remind you of certain things and if you think you know this this can also just kind of help reinforce what you know and make sure that you're you know taking the best care you can of yourself yeah yeah so. yeah yeah great Debbie, thank you so much. I'm really looking forward to this. And I will be introducing each program just to, to keep kick everything off and, and say hello. So I'm looking forward to seeing folks who, who come and participate. Great. Thank you, Debbie. Clayton, thank you so much. I'm looking forward to starting. Oh, actually, September 22nd is the first day of fall. That's right. It's the perfect day to be starting this program because it's Falls Prevention Awareness Week. That's right. So we can be aware of fall while preventing falls. There's a, that's good. Excellent. <laughs> so I hope you enjoyed our conversation. That was me talking with Nurse Debbie Toomey, the coordinator of the Tufts Medical Center's Injury Prevention Program. We were talking about the Aging Strong Program uh, that's going to be happening here at the library uh, via Zoom and on YouTube and Facebook, happening on September 22nd, 29th, October 6th, and October 13th. Those are all four Tuesdays, right in a row, every week uh, from September 22nd to October 13th and it will be happening at 10 o'clock in the morning. Each program is gonna be about 90 minutes long. So make sure when you join us, you get a comfortable chair and uh, we look forward to seeing you there. Keep being strong and healthy. Are you a member of Red Sox Nation? Join us for a Red Sox celebration on Wednesday evening, September 23rd, when the author of the ultimate Boston Red Sox Time Machine book will join us for a wonderful evening. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Marty. Marty, thanks so much for joining me today and talking about this great program we're going to be doing, um, all about your book and our favorite hometown baseball team, the Boston Red Sox. How long have you been a Sox fan? I've been a Sox fan all my life. Actually, um, I visited uh, Boston in 1967, the impossible dream year when I was a kid. 67, did you say? Yes. Like two? How did you visit in 67? Oh, no, I was uh, 10. Wow. Yeah, I'm 63 years old now, but I... You're looking I good for 63, my friend. Well, thank you. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Yeah, we have a young-looking family, and it always uh, seems to work out real well with that. But um, So I was uh, visiting Boston with my parents, and uh, my dad took me to Fenway Park. And actually, you know, I, I the difference between Fenway Park and old Cleveland Municipal Stadium, which is this which was a mausoleum back then. It was 80,000 seats and was really far away. And there was only a trickling of fans show up. And here I am. It's the Fenway Park's right off the street. And there's all this hustle and bustle and all these fans pouring in. And then I come into the, to the Fenway, to Fenway Park and see this beautiful, you know, the uh, green monster and, and, and the, the close knit kind of uh, um, 
family atmosphere there. It was such a difference between Cleveland Municipal Stadium, and I fell in love with it immediately. And, and it was really at that time that I became a very ardent uh, Red Sox fan, along with being an, an Indians fan as well. But um, when I had an opportunity to write a book about the Red Sox, I jumped all over it when the publisher gave me that opportunity. And I, I've always been um, a huge Red Sox fan. And so your book is the ultimate Boston Red Sox time machine book. So That's correct. How did you, you know, what kind of resources did you go to, to jump back in time? How did you go and do it? Did you come and dig into the crates and dig into the bowels of Fenway Park? How did you go about your work? Yeah, well, I did. I, um, I, I used uh, a lot of online resources, obviously, um, and newspaper, old newspapers um, to, to go back. And a lot of it was from my own memory, too. Um, bases, you know, I based a lot of it on my own memory of um, Red Sox history, but I used... Uh, old newspaper foot uh, articles, and I used um, a lot of online sources and, and Red Sox books. And there are um, a lot of Red Sox books, including Bury the Curse. Yeah, that was uh, there were a lot of those that I used as well. But uh, I wanted to get, I wanted to make sure that this encompassed the entire history of the Red Sox from well before uh, the selling of Babe Ruth in 1919 uh, and um, and the I, curse. I wanted to, yes, I, I, I went right from the beginning uh, um, it, from about 1901. So really this is, the book is uh, based on 120 years of Red Sox history. And it's the, uh, the greatest and most interesting and unique uh, teams and players and events um, and moments in Red Sox history. And I know that you, when we were talking about this, you actually make it a bit interactive. You have some quizzes and such to see, because I know... I mean, there's a lot of Red Sox buffs around here, but I think that uh, you, you aim to have something to, so people can show off a little bit, but also hopefully to, to challenge some folks. I'm sure you dug up a lot of gems uh, and you're going to have some stuff that people probably have never heard before. Uh, maybe. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be, you know, imparting a lot of trivia and, you know, factual information and interesting uh, facts that people maybe do not know. Um, and then I, I'm going to have a lot of trivia questions. Um, I usually give about five to seven trivia questions uh, in during an event, and I, I don't want to make them so hard that nobody will know it, but I don't want to make them easy because I know there's, you know, Red Sox Nation is, is so passionate, and I know there's going to be some really knowledgeable Red Sox fans in the audience here, so I want to make it challenging, uh, yet not impossible. Uh, that sounds like a good time. Have you ever, uh, have you ever been to any of the concerts or anything in Fenway Park, too? Have you... Uh... I mean, there's such you know, a lot of ball games. I covered a lot of ball, lot of ball games there. Yeah, um, I, I covered playoffs. I covered the regu you know regular season games, and I, I, it's my favorite park to to go to because it has so much character and so much charm. Um, and uh, it's you know it, it and it's old school. I mean, the the thing with some of these new ballparks, they're wonderful new ballparks. I've been to the ones you know Cleveland and 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 Pittsburgh and. Uh, Seattle and so forth um, and they're wonderful new ballparks but there's nothing that matches the old school charm of Fenway Park and I'm hoping uh, maybe hoping against hope that it never gets replaced you know if they want to if it gets revitalized um, wonderful but I, I hope Fenway Park lasts as long as it can possibly last. Oh, it's always fun when you're down in the bowels of the park and you can see how it's grown they have that timeline so you can see how the park has changed over time. Yeah, yeah, well, and it has. It has. I mean, you know, obviously, uh, there have been some, uh, you know, uh, modernizations at Fenway Park, but it still has, it still has the Green Monster, and, it, you know, it still has, uh, um, you know, Pesky Pole, and it's got, it, it's just, um, it's always going to, it's always going to be like that, and, and, you know, even in a bad year, which is rare for the Red Sox, and they're having a bad year this year, Hey, hey, they just had that a rough weekend, but they had three in a row there. I know through Friday night. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. They're they're starting to come around. Their 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 pitching staff is just it needs uh you know with Chris Sale out and uh, Rodriguez out and um, they're gonna you know have to rebuild that pitching staff. But um, still you know and and I would I would assume this year if there were fans in the stands they'd still be drawing thirty thousand people there every night. Oh, I'm sure it'd be sell out every time. Yeah, you know, and and <laughs> it's it, uh, the 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 loyalty of Red Sox fans uh, imagine having gone through and, and fans in Cleveland know all about this too, but imagine having gone through. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, 
uh, what, 90, 96 years of, um, fu not futility, but 96 years of never having celebrated a world championship and, and having the, the loyalty involved there. How many, how many Red Sox fans went their whole life, you know, from birth to death, without having celebrated a world championship and still were passionate and, and you know, that the Red Sox just were beloved to them. And it's just amazing. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. Do you know anything? So I know that the night of this program, they're going to be actually battling. I, I just saw they're battling the Orioles, which as we're recording this, they're two and two in the latest series of the Orioles. Um, do you know anything? Do you have any uh, you know nuggets about the, the kind of the history between those two teams for folks that may be, you know, watching, joining us for this program and then, you know, using their DVR to, to watch the rest of the game? Well, there were a lot of periods of time, in fact, probably most periods of time. Now, the Orioles didn't come into existence until the 50s, but there were, there were a lot of periods of time where the Orioles were, were a sensational team and the Red Sox were mediocre and then the other way around. Um, the one era that I know that both teams were pretty strong were in the uh, late 60s and early 70s, but, the, you know, the Orioles had all that great pitching and the Red Sox had all that great hitting. And um, they, they, you know, they battled pretty strongly then. Um, but, um, you know, and then a little bit in the 90s too. But there were the, the times when both teams were, um, you know, lights out, uh, were, were World Series championship contenders have been fairly rare since the 1950s. Well, it certainly is exciting right now. And I'm glad that we can celebrate the Red Sox. And, and at least we're watching ball games again. I had a bunch of friends who were watching – uh, Korean baseball for a while. Yeah, um, well, yes, at yeah, at five in the morning. Yeah. Holy cow! <laughs> yeah, so, you got to uh, really baseball. be a baseball fan to do that. Yeah, well, I got some serious hardcore baseball for friends that are serious hardcore fans. So they just yeah, cruise. well, the lie there are certainly a lot of them in Red Sox Nation. I mean, all the way up from you know to Maine, you know, New Hampshire and Vermont and Rhode Island and Maine oh, and yeah. Connecticut, and then and then the millions of Red Sox fans that are scattered across the country who have. We got a fair number in New York. We won't mention the team from there, but I do know that there's a lot of big Red Sox Nation presence in New York. Even. Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, you know, Red Sox fan clubs everywhere. Absolutely. In, 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 including New York. In fact, uh, when you when you attend, or you know, you attend or watch on TV a Red Sox Yankees game from Yankee Stadium. I'm sorry, I don't know that team. Uh, <laughs> oh, that's right. I mentioned. Oh, sorry, I mentioned them. <laughs> but you'll hear a smattering of applause and cheering for the Red Sox when they do something well. And right. it's, it's, uh, it's very pronounced. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, and, and obviously there are a lot of uh, Red Sox fans that travel to the Big Apple, I guess we'll say it, um, to watch the Red Sox play there. Also. Absolutely. Yeah, especially in times, well, yeah, we could even do it today. So the travel restrictions are such that we can go to New York, whereas we can't go to, we, we can't stop in Rhode Island overnight, but we can go to New York. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I I suppose I can understand that, but uh, it's it's really a strange, strange thing to watch games on television and, and see these cardboard cutout fans out there and this yeah, fake the noise, the, the, the noise. roar of the crowd. It's, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I, and I, I like it. I mean, I like it better than complete silence. You know, I'm glad that they're doing that to have some kind of, you know, atmosphere, baseball atmosphere to it, but it's uh, – you know, and, and you're, you know, for a while you kind of get lost in it. Then you're thinking, wait a minute, nobody's really there to make this noise. <laughs> I think the players appreciate it, too. I think it'd be really weird yes. to be playing in an empty stadium. I think it took them a while to get used to even the way they're doing it now, but I think that it, it, it made it easier for them. Yeah, I agree. Well, Marty, I'm really excited for this program. I'm really glad we can celebrate baseball. We'll be watching in the stands again. It will come. We'll get our time. Uh, we yeah, stay safe. I'm looking forward to ta talking about uh, Cy Young and, and Babe Ruth before he was uh, shipped off to New York and Ted Williams and Carl Yastrzemski and Big Poppy and, um, you know, Tony Canigliaro. I got all sorts of chapters on individual players, and it's awesome. just going to be a lot of fun. I think uh, it's going to be a really fun and enlightening program. I'm sure we're going to have a blast. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks for having me. appreciate right. it. Norman Rockwell had a wonderful way of capturing human emotions and experiences. Over the course of his life, his depiction of the diversity of American culture grew significantly. We're hosting a program with college art history professor Jane O'Neill, all about Rockwell's evolving views on race on Monday, September 28th, starting at 7. Eileen recently had the opportunity to talk with Jane about this program, 
but I hope you enjoy it. Well, um, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Eileen. I'm with the Thomas Crane Public Library. And today we're talking to Jane O'Neill of Culturally Curious. Uh, she's going to be doing a program for us online on Monday, September 28th at 7 p.m. Um, and you can join us on YouTube, Facebook, or on Zoom. Um, and welcome, Jane. Hi. Thanks for having me. Oh, good to see you. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your background with Culturally Curious and, and sure. how you got into art and, and what you're going to be talking about in, um, in our program on the 28th? Sure, I'd love to. So my background is in art history and in education, and I have a master's degree in both of those things. And it basically means, I always say to people, it basically means that I really like looking at pictures, but I really love talking to groups about them. So, um, so I put together Culturally Curious today's actually the third anniversary of Culturally oh. Curious. I'm so happy. Happy anniversary. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and, um, and what Culturally Curious does is um, it, it brings groups together to look at and talk about art. And, um, and I have a lot of fun putting the programs together and then facilitating them. And they can be on a variety of subjects. I, I did Van Gogh mm -hmm. at the Thomas Green Library earlier this year. Um, but Norman Rockwell is such an American icon. We're all sort of familiar with him. He makes people feel good. But he had his own interesting evolution in terms of how he approached the subject of race. And, um, and then I think what most people don't know is that he ends up leaving the famous Saturday Evening Post where he had almost a 50 year career so that he could explore and represent the issues of race in America um, yeah. more freely. Yeah. I had no idea about that. And, and, you know, people do recognize a few of his famous works. I think the one with the police officer sitting next to the, right. the child at the counter. And of course, the famous Ruby Bridges um, right. yeah. artwork. Um, and I assume that's a couple that you'll be talking about. Um, I definitely the Ruby Bridges one. <laughs> um, I sort of started off talking about inclusion and exclusion, just really broad, broad terms, um, because I think everybody sort of has a notion of, of what Norman Rockwell's artwork is like and, and how we connect with it, how he was such a powerful storyteller and he could show an image that we can instantly connect with. And sometimes those images were about making us feel like Americans. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those images were making us, uh, helping us to connect with what it feels like to be isolated. And so those were the big broad brushstrokes. And, um, and then I sort of show what the Saturday Evening Post was doing during the 1930s and the 1940s and, and um, how Norman Rockwell was responding to that with his artwork and then in his own personal life and then why he decides to make a, a departure from there. Oh, wow. That is very interesting. Yeah, I had no idea that he had departed to really focus on those types of issues. Yeah. That's not something... That I learned in school. <laughs> right. it's, it's like when we think of Norman Rockwell, we just think, you know, uh, middle class America, right. you know, post World War II, everything's good. Like when we talk about Norman Rockwell moments, when I look at my own kids and I'm like, oh, this is a Norman Rockwell scene, you just think, you know, quintessential American middle class happiness, right? Right, right. <laughs> but right after he left um, the Saturday Evening Post, he actually sent money into the NAACP for a lifetime membership. So race was um, at the forefront of his mind. And I think that, again, this is such a great program to talk about it because I think people who are sort of at any level of comfort talking about race, whether it's like you're brand new to it or, or you're pretty steeped in it, um, this, is, this is like a good starting point because Norman Rockwell is so safe and he's so familiar, you know? Right. And, and we see him sort of slowly inching towards, you know, being a more progressive thinker. Yeah. So this is definitely something that's timely. It's something that's going on in America right now that we probably will, you know, relate to, I would imagine. So. Absolutely. Yeah, so. <laughs> and, and it's funny because I did, I, I originally put together this talk at the beginning of this year, um, back in January. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it touches on all these different things that have since become these big touch point conversations throughout the year. So, um, so it's interesting to think about how all of these things um, sort of keep kind of emerging in our national conversations yeah. and how they're 
still, they're still sensitive and they still need to be explored. And again, Norman Rockwell helps us do that in a very safe way. Right. I hope that we get, you know, get some, some good conversation uh, going with that and see how, how art and current events kind of relate to each other. So it should be very yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the best part of this is that it's actually uplifting too. I think oh. every who experiences this program sort of comes away feeling better. Um, I facilitated a lot of these programs back at the beginning of the year when you could still do it in person. And I had like, I brought it to so many groups and the people had tears in their eyes afterwards and they're like hugging and telling me about their personal experiences. And I think it just, it brings out the best in us. And and, and I think you people come away from it feeling better. Yeah. Yeah. And it's yeah. amazing that art can do that for us. You know, yeah, I am absolutely. personally a huge art fan too and thrilled that we get to offer this and, um, and hopefully that'll like, you know, evolve conversations too. Yeah, absolutely. So excellent. Um, well, um, so do you have anything else to add about what you're going to be speaking about or is this um a good little teaser and get people excited about it. This is the good teaser. I mean, I can get so into it right now, but but there's a lot of, I think, revelations as you go oh, okay. through it too. So I don't want to spoil the fun. Yeah. So there'll be definitely some learning, yeah. some learning times in there, yeah. and we look forward to that. So again, thank you for joining us, Jane. Uh, again, that was uh, Jane O'Neill from Culturally Curious, and she's going to be speaking about Norman Rockwell and his evolving views on race. Uh, Monday, September 28th at 7 p.m. online and uh, visit us at thomascranelibrary.org to find all the links on how you can join and um, learn about Norman Rockwell. So thank you very much, Jane. Thank you. See you then. See ya. We're ready to answer your questions. Thomas Crane Public Library librarians are standing by to answer your questions Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m and Friday and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Let us answer your reference questions, get you started with our digital resources, and help you get the physical materials you need during this stressful time. If you want to reach us outside of these hours, you can email us at quref at oclm.org, or you can fill out our Ask a Librarian form. You can also send us a text or chat with us using the resource on our homepage. Just go out to thomascreenlibrary.org and you'll see the link there. Are you interested in practicing your English skills? The library's ESOL classes will be online this fall. These classes are designed for people who do not speak English as a first language. Classes meet online one day a week for an hour and 15 minutes using Zoom. Fall classes are beginning the week of Monday, September 21st and will meet for 10 weeks. Classes are led by one or two trained volunteer teachers, and a maximum of eight students are going to be enrolled in each class. All of our classes include the opportunity to meet new people and make new connections with others in our community. We really miss gathering in person, but we're happy to have this opportunity to continue connecting with our students. Online classrooms can can be productive, informative, and fun even. The classes include an advanced conversation class where participants will be uh, participating in discussions on various topics, practicing the correct use of advanced vocabulary and conversation, and practicing improving pronunciation, something I need to do sometimes. There will also be an intermediate English practice uh, class where you can practice the language needed for everyday situations like going to the grocery store, taking public transportation, or going to the doctor. You can also practice using new vocabulary correctly in conversation and just feel more confident communicating in English with people in our community. We have intermediate we, we have intermediate reading classes where you can read and discuss a story, learn and practice new vocabulary related to the story, and practice and improve your pronunciation. We have a citizenship class where you can prepare for all three parts of the naturalization exam and learn about the application process. And we have a simple, how was your week class? Uh, And in this, how was your week class? You will participate in conversations about how everybody's doing in this really unusual and difficult time. Connect with others during a time when a lot of us are just staying at home and maybe feeling the need for friendship and conversation. To register, all you need to do is give us a call at 617-376-3295 
or you can email us at quenglishtalk at ocln.org. We'll return your message within 24 hours as best as we're able. Spots are limited, so please contact us as soon as you're interested. We really look forward to seeing you again soon. We want to know how you're faring during this COVID-19 pandemic. Please submit photos, videos, journal entries, art, music, and audio messages to the Quincy COVID Memories Project and help us record how our residents are living through this pandemic. This month, we are hoping that you will give us recordings about what it's like going back to school and how you and your family are enjoying the autumn. The, the library, along with the City of Quincy, Quincy 400, and Quincy Access Television, are collaborating to collect these moments in time from our neighbors and archive these documents. Please submit your documents as many times as you'd like throughout the pandemic. To get more information, you can go out to our website. We have a blog post about it. We have a video you can watch, and you can actually go and look at what other people have submitted so far. Please, just let us know how you're doing. And in addition to all these programs for adults this month, we have lots for teens and younger people too. We take a bit of a break with younger programs as school starts back up, but please check out our website, thomascranelibrary.org, and the children's Facebook page to get the most up-to-date information. That's all for this episode of At Your Library. Hopefully, you've enjoyed learning about some of what's happening at your library this month. If you'd like to learn more, I strongly encourage you to subscribe to our monthly newsletter, where you can also find some staff picks for some of our favorite things we're reading, watching, and listening to. The best way to stay up to date on the latest library news is to visit thomascranelibrary.org. Sign up for our monthly email newsletter, like our Facebook pages, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Clayton Cheever. Thank you for joining me for a look at what's happening at your library this month. I hope you enjoyed the conversations I've shared and learning more about what's going on at your library. We're working hard to bring you what you need in these challenging times, and I hope you'll join us online to appreciate all of our efforts. Please continue to stay safe and healthy. I look forward to seeing you again in October. Mm -hmm.